The amount of force before motion occurs. We're told here that the boxes are homogeneous and each box weighs 150 pounds. There's a free, the box, the top box and the bottom box are not rigidly connected, but there's a, a friction between them. Between the boxes, that mu s is 0.65. And there's also friction between the bottom box and the floor. And that coefficient is 0.35. So we'll draw the free body diagrams for this, but first let's think about what are the different ways that our system could move if we're pushing on the box with that force P. So what's one way that our system could go into motion? Yeah. The top box could slip off the bottom. Right, so the bottom one stays put and the top one just slides off it. The two boxes stay together and slide as a unit relative to the ground. So two ways it could slide. The top box could tip relative, so it could tip at that right corner. The two boxes stay together and tip at point B at the bottom is another way. So there's four possible ways that motion could occur here. And we're going to have to individually consider what would it take for any one of those to happen. And then the, our process is going to be whichever one happens first is the hardest we can push before motion is going to occur. Because once one of those motions occurs, our equilibrium equations are then going to not be true anymore because it's no longer in static equilibrium. So the first one that happens is the motion that would happen. We need to consider, since the two boxes are not together, they're not one rigid body, we want to separate them like we would a frames and machines problem. I will start by modeling what happens to the top box what are the forces that act on the top box? Right, there's a normal force. I'll actually save that one for right now. I'll put that one on later. And what other forces act on the top box? Because it's resting on the bottom box, we presume that if we're pushing it to the right, which I'll actually start with that, that applied force, if we push it to the right, it will want to move to the right also. So the friction force will be opposing that from the bottom box on the top. And I'll call that FR1. It's going to be located at that contacting surface, and it's going to be parallel to the contacting surface. And we think it's to the left because the box wants to go to the right. And we're applying this force, which is another force we have to include, a half foot above the base of the box. The weight of the box, it weighs 150 pounds. And the box is homogeneous. So we can say that that gravity, that weight, is going to act at its center, 1.5 feet from the left and the right side. The normal force, we have to model that as well. Here it's a surface of the top box in contact with the surface of the bottom box. We can't just say that the normal force acts at the center of the box. Again, in reality, it's some sort of distribution. We don't care what the distribution looks like, though. We can integrate it. And we can find the total force, which we call the normal force. And we can position it at the centroid of this, which I'm going to call D1. I don't know what either of those values are, but in my model, I can just include them in my picture. The normal force acts with some amount N1, some distance from this corner, I'll call Q. And I'll call that distance D1. But as we saw in the distributed load section, I can simplify a distributed load into a point load located at the centroid of the distributed force. And from this picture, then, there are four things I don't know. <laughs> that distance, that normal force, the friction, one, and the applied force, P, which ultimately I'm trying to find. So from this picture, I have four unknowns, and I will only be able to generate three equations. So I'll put this aside for the moment and go on to my second picture. Now I have the lower crate as my second free body diagram. And I'm isolating it from the ground that it's resting on. I'm isolating it from the top box that it's in contact with. And I want to model the forces that act on the second box. So what forces act on the bottom box? Its own weight, which is also 150 pounds, and also in the center. The other side of that normal force. 
It will turn out for this problem that it is just the weight, but in general, it could be the weight and other applied loads that act on it. So we're modeling here, the bottom box pushes up on the top box with a force of N1, but the top box pushes down on the bottom box with that equal and opposite force located at that same location, D1. I have to include the force that the ground exerts on the crate. I'll call that N2. And I don't know where that's located either, so I'll say it's a distance of D2 from point B. <coughs> this FR1 is what the bottom box does to the top box. So the top box will do an equal and opposite force on the bottom box. So also FR1, but pointing to the right. The bottom box is preventing this from moving to the right, but the, the top box is trying to drag the bottom box with it to the right with that same frictional force FR1. Again, parallel to the surface, but in the opposite direction. And finally, there's going to be the friction force I'll call FR2 between the ground and my bottom crate. I presume that it would want to move to the right, so that friction force 2 will be facing to the left. And then this will be my complete free body diagram, all the forces that act on my second crate. If I count my unknowns, I had four up here. I've introduced two more, uh, three more, for a total of seven unknowns between my two free body diagrams. Now we know from rigid body that we can only get three equations out of each one. So we'll have six equilibrium equations and we'll need at least one more equation in order to solve our system, which we'll get from the different ways that this can move. But the equilibrium equations are going to be true no matter what condition we're testing. Is it slipping or is it tipping? So I'll begin by writing those equilibrium equations. From the first picture, if I sum forces in the x direction, again, I'm assuming we're in equilibrium for everything, so it's equal to zero, I'll get P minus FR1. And I will rearrange this, because it'll be helpful later, to say that P is then, when I'm in equilibrium, the applied force has to equal my friction force one. In the Y, I have the weight force down, but I have that first normal force up. And it does turn out in this case that that N1 is 150 pounds. It is equal to the weight force, but generally that's not necessarily true. We showed that's true by summing forces in the Y. And I can take a moment equation I'm going to do it around that corner Q because presumably that's where it would tip if it started to tip. So forces that act, uh, moments that act around Q, I will have the weight acting 1.5 feet away. 1.5 feet times the 150 pounds. I have my applied force P acting 0.5 times P. And then the normal force acting, also negative, N1 times D1. But I do know from equation 2 already, N1 has a value of 150. I can take my equation number 3 here, and I will solve, just so it's convenient later, D1 in terms of P. My, that distance is going to be equal to... Uh, 1.5 minus 0 0.0033p. I wouldn't have to do this now, but when we get to the later steps, uh, this will be helpful. So I have my distance one in terms of the applied force p if we're in equilibrium. I only have a number so far for n1. I can't solve for p yet from the equilibrium equations. And I can't solve for d yet. Uh, because I have too many unknowns. So I'll move on and make my other set of equilibrium equations using my second free body diagram. In this picture, I have FR1 to the right and FR2 to the left. I already know from equation 1 that FR1 is equal to P. I know from equation 4 that FR1 must equal FR2. So FR2 must also be equal to P when we're in equilibrium.
in the y direction, I have the weight of this crate down. I have that normal force 1 also pointing down, which I know its value from equation 2. And pointing up, I have normal force 2. From this equation, that second normal force is 300 pounds. It turns out to be the combined weight of, of crate 1 and crate 2. And finally, I can take the moments around point B in picture 2. And I'll have the weight force 1.5 feet away. I'll have that normal force N1 times D1 counterclockwise around B, minus 4.5 times FR2. I know FRT, FR2 is equal to P. I know N1 was equal to 150. And I'll have minus N2 times D2. I know N2 is equal to 300. So actually, N2, FR2, N1, I know in terms of other things. D1, I know in terms of P. So I can rearrange equation 6, which will be helpful. I can find D2 in terms of P is 1.5 minus 0 0.0167 times P. Six equations, seven unknowns at this point. But these are all the equilibrium equations I can generate uh, using the two free body diagrams that I have. All right, so now we're out of equilibrium equations. We have to still generate at least one more equation to solve this for P. This is where we consider the different ways that our system can go into motion. We discussed there were four possibilities. We need to, one at a time, look at what is the implication for that particular motion to occur. I'll call motion A if box 1 is on the verge of slipping relative to box 2, or top box slips on bottom. And for all these, we're considering when it's just about to slip or just about to tip. For condition A to happen, what has to be true equation-wise? What can I write as a seventh equation when box A is just about to slip relative to box B? When it's on the verge of slipping, that means that the friction force is at the maximum value it can be. So when it's equal to mu times n, there, it can't be any higher than that. So on the verge of slipping is when we can say that this expression is true. So to find that friction force 1, it's the coefficient of friction between the two neighboring surfaces times the normal force or the contact force between those surfaces. We were given that mu s was... That's the 0.65, and we found that normal force 1 was the 150 pounds. Therefore, our FR1, when it's at its maximum value, is going to be equal to 97.5. And since we know for equilibrium that the applied force has to equal that friction force, then PA I'll call it, is 97.5 pounds. So if we apply 97.5 pounds, the top box is just about to start to slip relative to the bottom box. But there were three other ways that this could move that we still have to consider as separate events. So let's now look at what if the top box is just about to tip at Q. What we do here is these six equations are still true since we're in equilibrium, but now we have a different equation seven that we're going to couple with these six equations. What is our new equation seven when condition B is true? That the top box is just about to tip at that lower right-hand corner. When we're about to tip, the normal force goes directly beneath the point, the pivot point, of where we're going to tip. So if we think we're going to tip this way, about point Q, 
D1 is going to have a value of 0, placing N1 directly beneath it. So our new equation, our different equation 7, we set D1 equal to 0. Again, we couple this with these six equations, and we'll see why this re reforming it this way was convenient. In my rearrange equation 3, if I set 0 equal to D1, then I can solve for P. So in, under this condition, I would have to apply a force of 450 pounds for it to tip at that lower right-hand corner. Already, if I apply 97 and a half pounds, it's going to start to slip. Once it starts to move, other types of motion could happen, but the rest of this relies, this relies on things that are no longer true. Once it moves, these are not equal to zero anymore, so we can't actually get to the point where we could tip it at point Q. So because this is higher than this, I can disqualify this as being a possible way it's going to move if I'm looking at what's going to happen first. So it's going to slide before it can tip. I still have the two other ways that it could move that I have to consider. B I've eliminated. I'll erase it just in the interest of space here. We could also think that the two boxes move together and slide relative to the floor. We introduce a different equation, 7, here. What equation will be true when the boxes as a unit are just about to slide relative to the floor? Right, so now this bottom friction force is at its maximum value. That is that coefficient of friction they told us was mu s prime times those contact force, which was N2. Mu s prime was only 0.35. N2 was 300 pounds. The maximum that friction force 2 is able to be then is going to be uh, 105 pounds. We know from equation 4 that FR2 has to be equal to P for us to still be in equilibrium. This tells us that P has to be 105 pounds for both boxes to slip together relative to the floor. But again, it, once we apply only 97.5 pounds, A is already going to slide relative to B which means that these equations then will no longer be true. So we can eliminate C as the way that it's going to move because it's higher than that 97.5. So still, condition A is so far happening first. We said that the last way we could have motion is that the boxes together tip at point D. Or, uh, sorry, point B. So I introduce yet a different equation 7. And what will be true if the boxes are just about to tip at point D then? The normal force 2 is directly under point B. So N2 shifts all the way to B. And this is why I said D1 was being measured from this corner and D2 was being measured from that corner. It makes the equations much easier to write. If D2 is equal to 0, and we have this rearranged equation 6 here, that means that P, for, for condition D to be true, would have to be 90 pounds. We already eliminated C and B, so we really just are comparing it to A. It's less than A, so this is actually the first thing that's going to occur, is tipping at D, and it will not slide. Uh, the top box and the bottom slide will not slide relative to each other before we're going to tip both boxes at point B.